Um, I also want to, uh, before we get started, I want to say that I'm wearing this red tie because this coming Tuesday is St. Valentine's Day when we celebrate the fact that St. Valentine was martyred for, for officiating at the marriages of uh, Christian couples in, uh, in ancient Rome. That is why I'm wearing a red tie today. Okay. I also, I also want to say that I will not be quoting from the prophet Kelsey as I saw on one church reader board this week. That is not why I'm wearing a red tie. Okay, that's enough frivolity. We are in the midst of a sermon series on what makes Christ Church Leavenworth tick. Why we do the things we do, why we are the way we are, what our DNA is. As you've all heard, or already know, at least those of you that aren't visitors, we did a series like this in the early days of our church, but we have many new families since that time. So your elders thought it would be a good idea to revisit the topics that make us what we are. We started with worship because everything we do flows from the worship of the triune God. Next, we heard about confession and repentance because we are all sinners in need of God's grace. Then we heard about music and why we sing psalms especially, but also hymns from the past, and why we try to learn them in harmony so we can be excellent in our singing. We then heard about children in the covenant and love of the local church, a sermon that I'm sorry I missed last week, but I did listen to it. Today, I'm going to talk about the need for Christian education. This is a topic that makes us different from much of modern evangelicalism. Although since the COVID and CRT debacles, maybe not as different as it once did. It's also a topic that most of you have already spent a great deal of time thinking about and have already made the decision to only give a Christian education to your own children. So I suspect that much of what I have to say today will be review. But it's good to review. And there's no question that education of our children is an important topic. And by our there, I mean the entire nation. There has been a firestorm over education since the COVID pandemic. First about the failure of public schools to teach anything during the lockdown. Then about the critical training on race, gender, and climate that has taken the place of actual education of our nation's children. This is represented by the titles of books and newsletters that I've seen recently. Hillsdale College's Imprimus newsletter recently had an issue entitled Edu Education as a Battleground. And there's a book out there called The Battle for, for the American Mind. Education was just considered a given a half century ago. It was something that all children did without a parent giving it a lot of thought. Now, it's a battleground. Probably most people in this room understand this, but I don't think the vast majority of the culture does, and that includes the Christian culture. So I've chosen Deuteronomy 6, verses 7 through 9 as my text this, message, uh, this morning, but I'm going to read the first uh, nine verses of Deuteronomy 6 to give some context. So this is the word of the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. Now, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house 
when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Let's pray. Lord God, as always, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would teach us from your word this morning. We ask that you would teach us your commandments, your statutes, your judgments. Teach us to apply them to our lives. Teach us how to know you and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, we pray. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I read the first nine verses of Deuteronomy 6 to give, context, to give the context of the passage. We're also familiar with Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema of Israel, that I think we often fail to see it in relation to the entire passage. Deuteronomy means, after all, the second law. It is the second giving of the law. On the eve of the Israelites going into Canaan to take the land that God has promised them. Moses reviews God's teaching for the people before entering the land. In chapter 5, he reviews the Ten Commandments. Then in our passage, Moses makes commentary on, the, on God's law. The people are to know God's commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, as it says in verse 1, so that they may fear him, verse 2. Fear means reverence here. But the people were also reminded of the terror that they felt toward God on Mount Sinai when the mountain was enveloped in smoke and fire, as we learn in Exodus chapter 19. Fear of the Lord is the result of knowing God's commands, statutes, and judgments. It's also the motive for keeping the the commands of God that you may fear the Lord your God to keep his statutes and commandments, which I command you, our passage says. This is in keeping with Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Obedience to God's commands is for the children and grandchildren also. Then the Lord, through Moses' words in verses 2 and 3, promises blessings of prosperity for the people for keeping his commands, that your days may be prolonged, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly, and that you may dwell in the land flowing with milk and honey. In verse 4, the Shema, Moses proclaims the basic truth of all real religion. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is one God, and he is the God of the Israelites. He's also our God. All other gods are incorrect, whether it be multiple gods, false gods, or no God. And the response to knowing there is one God and that he is our God is to love him with all our heart, with all our heart soul, and strength, with every ounce of our being, in other words. Here is the command to love. It seems odd to command love. We usually think of love as an affection that happens out of mutual attraction, whether it's between spouses, parents and children, siblings, or friends. But this tells us that the affection of love can be learned, indeed that it must be learned. And the affection of love must be applied to the correct object, God. Loving God means loving his commandments and having them on our heart, as it says in verse 6. We commonly think of the New Covenant promise in Jeremiah 13 that the law will be written on the hearts of God's people. And with the Holy Spirit, there is more power in the New Covenant to have God's law inside us. But you will notice that even here in Deuteronomy, before entering the promised land, God's people were to internalize God's law, having it written on their hearts. And now we come to verse 7, the text for this morning. You shall teach them diligently to your children. One phrase in verse 2 that I barely touched on is that the commands are for you, your sons, and your grandsons. 
And if God com God's commands and promises are for the children, here in verse 7, we see that the children and grandchildren must be taught. Just by living in a family, the children may pick up the basics of knowledge about God, but they should also be taught. And they should be taught diligently and constantly. God's word should be co so constant in the minds of his people that it should be tied on their heads and on their hands. The Jews, since this time, literally put God's word in little boxes and tied it on their heads. Jesus talks about that in the New, in the New Testament. But this was so that God's word may guide their heads and their hands, their thoughts and their actions. Just as the people of Israel, hearing from Moses, were commanded to fear the Lord, to love him and to obey him, and to teach their children, so we also are commanded to teach our children. And that, of course, leads us to the topic of education. I'm going to discuss this roughly under three headings. The need for, the need for Christian education, the need for education, the re requirement that the education be Christian, and what an education actually is. Need, Christian, and education. First, need. The need for Christian education can be thought of in two ways. The problem with education as it stands right now in our country and the solution to that problem. Let's start with the problem. Our culture gives lip service to having a high view of education. It is about the children, after all. And education is always seen as the solution to the problem of evil. If people just know more, they will behave better. But our secular, postmodern, relativistic culture cannot really define evil since they really have no fixed standard. So it's pretty hard to teach what evil is if you don't know for, your, for sure yourself what it is. One of the chief goals of education is to teach right behavior, to teach morals, to teach character. But it can't be done apart from a standard. And prior to the late 19th century, schools in the West, including in the United States, were based on the standard of God's law. That clearly is no longer the case and has not been for a century now. I'm going to give a history, I hope brief enough, of what happened to education. This is largely based on several books. J. Gresham Machen's book, Education, Christianity, and the State, as well as a more current book by Hegseth and Goodwin, the previously mentioned Battle for the American Mind. There are also little tidbits from C.S. Lewis, Douglas Wilson, and Dorothy Sayers. Public education in this country was based on God's law up until the late 19th century, as I said. First, there was a push to make education compulsory. My own state of Oregon, the state I was born in, actually passed a law to make public education mandatory in 1925. Fortunately, that was struck down by the Supreme Court. About the same time, or a little before that, in 1892, a Christian socialist minister named Francis Bellamy composed a pledge, which we now have in modified form as the Pledge of Allegiance. It replaced Christian creeds like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed in schools. His pledge was also accompanied by a salute to the flag. Some of you probably know this. That salute has since been dropped because it was a little too similar to the one in Nazi Germany. John Dewey later pushed the narrative of a Christianless public education for all the nation's children. But they had a problem. They could not use their pledges or any other part of their foundations to produce character and character was still thought to be important. So they tried to use the second table of the Ten Commandments without the first table. They tried to use the moral commands about dealing with people without the moral commands to worship the Lord your God. They tried to use, later, a list of traits for a good American, which were basically patriotic. Ultimately, any attempt at inducing good character gave way to the subjective, how people feel not how they were to behave. That's obviously where we are now. But it didn't just start. It's been going on gradually 
for 100 years. The lack of character in public education has been on full view for a long time, but it keeps getting more evident. A few years ago, all people worried about was, were school shootings, which, don't get me wrong, are bad. But now, boys can be girls, and boys can use girls' bathrooms. How soon before someone wants to be a lion and will be justified by his personal self-identity for harming other human beings? But in talking about the need for Christian education, we don't just need to focus on character. We can also focus on the failure of academics in our schools. And this too had been going on long before the COVID pandemic brought it into full focus. The public schools cannot even teach academic subjects. And this happened before it became racist to add two plus two and get four. Even George Orwell commented about that in his book, 1984. And Jill and I, both products of the public schools of the 60s and 70s, could regale you with stories ad nauseum about the failure of our public educations. Unfortunately, though, that too was part of the program. Whether it was President Woodrow Wilson or John Dewey, the idea of public school became training children up for work for all the menial work that needs to be done in any society, but not, of course, by the elite leaders that are guiding the country, the culture, and the schools. And don't get me wrong, I am not downgrading menial work. God calls each of us to a certain vocation, and different vocations glorify God equally, whether it's driving a garbage truck or preaching a sermon. And believe me, I've done both. But the point is, public education became a turning of the masses into worker bees, the proletariat, the proles. C.S. Lewis once said that education is essentially for freemen and vocational training is for slaves. The elites wanted the masses to do the menial work and in so teaching them, turned them into slaves. And that is the next need for Christian education, the need for liberty. True education, including education in character or virtue, is required for freedom. Our nation was founded based on the Christian view of the world, and all the founders were educated along Christian lines. The law of God, the fear of the Lord, the love of the Lord. Just as we have read in Deuteronomy 6, some of the, our founders may have downgraded their faith to deism, as did Jefferson and Franklin, or to masonry like George Washington, but they all knew that freedom depends on knowledge of God the Creator and the virtue inherent in following His law. It is thus no secret why we are losing the liberties our founders fought and died for. We have raised several generations, my own included, of kids in public schools, teaching them that work is the point of education and all that other stuff whether intellectual or moral, is super superfluous. We have raised several generations of slaves, slaves who think they are free. So that is a brief review, I hope it was brief enough, of the failure of public education in this country. The real need for Christian education, though, is found in our Bible passage this morning, and it is the solution also to the problem. The primary reason we need Christian education is because our God demands it. We are to know him as best we can, which must be based on his word. We are to know his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments. We are to teach them to our children and grandchildren. We are to fear him because he is the Lord creator of the entire universe. And we are to love him because he is the Lord our God who brought the Israelites of old out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Our bondage may not be physical slavery like the Israelites, but our bondage to sin is just as real. He did this through the Messiah that was promised to our first parents, who was promised throughout many Old Testament covenants and fulfilled in the incarnation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The need for Christian education of our children is because everything is to be brought into relation to the triune God. Everything is to be brought into covenant to God. 
We cannot truly know anything about our world without knowing it in relation to God. Whether the knowledge of the world he made, or the history of the world, or the language God has used to reveal himself. Besides knowledge, true knowledge, we cannot learn anything like character without knowing God's commands. And there is no solution to the problem of evil without the Lord Jesus Christ. Education by itself cannot solve why men do evil, why they behave badly. Only in Christ is there not only forgiveness of sin, but there is the power to break free from that sin. And that is true liberty, the liberty to do good for the sake of Christ's kingdom, for the sake of his world. As he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Along with the requirement to commit the education of our children to God comes the promise of blessings. Isn't that amazing? God commands that we do things and then blesses us for doing them. Long life, prosperity, full families, full barns. So the reason we need Christian education is that it is the only thing that will make America right again. Without Christian education, we will fall to some kind of totalitarianism. It may be the Marxist kind to which we seem to be running. I guess we all want to be Venezuela. Perhaps we will all, oh no, I'm sorry. Perhaps there will be a right-wing fascist reaction to that, which will be just as bad as an, a bad an answer as the Marxist one. Perhaps we will all end up speaking Chinese and using their social credit system. It doesn't matter. Without Christ, America cannot be what she was founded to represent. Without Christ and without Christian education, we will lose our country. That's the need. The education of our children must also be Christian. Much of what I've already said speaks to this. Our covenant duty to bring every endeavor into relation to God. As 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. No fact can be learned in a neutral environment. You will either learn the fact based on God and his word, or you will try to learn it without God. I used to think that mathematics could be taught without reference to God. Recent history has shown the folly of this thinking on my part. So the education we give our children must be Christian because God requires it of us. Christian education is also superior to secular education because it is possible to build virtue. It is possible to build character. It is possible to make children noble, as I saw in a quote from another book that Kevin Hadley sent me. God's word promises that when we train up a child in the way he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart from it, as it says in Proverbs 22.6. Education must also be Christian for the good of Christian individuals and for the good of the church. There is an intellectual content to the Christian faith. We don't just get to worship any old Jesus of our imaginings. We only get to worship the true God, the true Jesus, and that is revealed only in his word. Our faith must be based on God's word alone. That is important for the defending the faith, whether it's in our own minds or in the public square. As Machen said, the Christian religion flourishes in light, not in darkness. Whenever the little thought seeps into our brains, is this really true? Or whenever someone challenges us in our faith, the intellectual knowledge of why we believe what we do is an important bulwark against these challenges. Christian knowledge is important for the building up of the church. Again, this is so the church and the individuals within it can withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. Besides, there is nothing better than knowing God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Here we have God giving up his prerogative of Godhood temporarily that he might live as we humans do, subject to all the temptations that we're subject to, subject to all the various problems of life on earth. This he did without committing any sin of his own, and yet gave of himself to suffer the wrath of God on behalf of his people. After dying for us on the cross, 
He was raised from the dead for the justification of his people before God. And now he has ascended to the right hand of the Father. He pleads our case before the Father when we sin. This God-man, this Jesus, suffered as much as it was possible to suffer on behalf of each of us here, and yet still loves us enough to advocate for us when we commit the very sin that caused his suffering in the first place. How can you not love that person, that Jesus? How can you not want to know all there is to know about that God? How can you not want to know about the world that he made? All of these reasons and many others are why the education of our children must be Christian. Finally, we must educate our children. There is a need for it. It must be Christian. It's also an education. It's teaching. It's what God commands his people in Deuteronomy 6-7. That verse also gives us our first point about the need for Christian education. It begins in the home. For much of the past century, parents have left the education of their children to the experts occupying the schools of the nation. This includes, unfortunately, most Christian parents. The problem with this has reared its ugly head in the recent past, as we've already talked about, with the revelation of CRT teaching. Parents were astonished at what their children were being taught, but they all shared in the blame. The downgrade had been going on for over a century, and parents were asleep at the switch. Education is the responsibility of the parents, and it begins at home. I said parents, but in point of fact, Education is the responsibility of fathers. This is hinted at in Deuteronomy 6.2 when it says that God's commandments and statutes are for you, your son, and your grandson. This most certainly does not mean that our daughters in the family do not have to learn God's law in order to obey it. But since the emphasis is placed on the males, and since the sons and the grandsons will be growing into fathers someday, it does mean the primary responsibility for the teaching of God's commands falls to the fathers. This is confirmed in Ephesians 6, 4, which says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the nurture and training and admonition of the Lord. It's on us, guys. It's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to make sure our children are getting a Christian education. We may not be primarily teaching our children, but we are called to oversee their education. If children are being homeschooled, it means that dads have to help pick the curriculum. It means that dads have to pay for the curriculum. It means that dads have to support their wives if little Johnny refuses to obey. If the children are going to day school, like St. Giles or Blue Springs, dads have to be involved with making sure homework gets done. Dads have to be involved if there are problems at school. It means that dads have to sacrifice some of the things that they want in order to pay for the education. It especially means dads have to be involved in making sure what is being taught and that, is it in that it is in line with scripture. If the child is in public school, the job becomes infinitely harder. Parents have to do their best to counteract the 16,000 hours of public indoctrination that a child will get in 12 years of public education. One hour of Sunday school or church a week will not suffice. John Dewey knew that and even said as much, which is why he wanted all the children to be educated in his public schools. Parents, especially dads, you also have to be careful of what is going on in something like an online school. I heard the other day of a Christian school online that is teaching the kids to write es essays from a feminist perspective. Can writing one from a criti critical LGBTQ perspective be far behind? This is one of the responsibilities of being head of the family, dads, making sure your kids are brought up in the training of the Lord. We dads do not get to relax. Education for our children must also be comprehensive. Children must see every facet of life, every fact of the world, in regard to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Abraham Kuyper famously said, there is not a square inch on the entire planet that Christ does not claim is his. 
That's true of every subject of education, English grammar, history, math, science, literature, languages, you name it. Children must see that the earth is to be studied because God made it. History is to be studied because it shows how God has acted in the past. Languages are to be studied because that is how God has revealed himself. All of this is based on the study of scripture, to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Knowing God better will allow the child to better know each subject. Because the Christian learner has the right object in his or her studies, namely God. And because the Christian learner has the correct goal, to glorify God forever. Education must also prepare young people to have dominion over the world that God made and placed us in. God gave the dominion mandate to Adam in, Gen in the garden, recorded in Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This was given before Adam fell into sin, but it was not canceled by the fall. The job of dominion only gets harder with sin. But just looking at that verse, we can see the necessity of study of all aspects of God's world. For instance, the birds and the animals are to be studied, which implies the raising and selective breeding of animals for our benefit and for God's glory. The study of cattle implies farming, Having dominion over the earth means studying geology to know what minerals are in the earth and the other sciences in order to know how to use them. Languages must be studied in order to communicate this knowledge to others, and so on. Education must be done for the glory of God so that we men can have dominion over his creation as he originally intended for us in the garden. Education must also be excellent. It must be excellent and comprehensive so that children can become virtuous adults, as we've talked about. Only by becoming virtuous can there be any true freedom. It must be excellent because we serve a God that does all things well. Education must be excellent in order to take dominion. Think of Moses educated in Pharaoh's house or Daniel and his friends being taught the language and literature of the Chaldeans so that they could serve in Babylon. Think of Paul, educated by the great Rabbi Gamaliel, which served him well after his conversion to Christ so that he could argue well with both Jews and Gentiles. More recent examples might include Calvin and his intense training in the law, or Edwards and his mastery of languages at a young age or Lewis and his training in classics, which enabled him to write Christian literature and give lectures on the radio. The education of our children must be excellent in order to prepare us to raise the next Calvin or Lewis. And we have to admit that we've started from behind in this regard. In the early 1900s, Christian reacted mostly in two ways to the secular scholarship that was going on around them the scholarship that produced Enlightenment philosophy, Darwinism, higher criticism, and so on. Many mainline Christians went along with it and became apostate. Many others took the fundamentalist route and reacted in an anti-intellectual fashion. They threw the baby out with the bathwater. They read the passage in Colossians that we read this morning, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, and decided that they wouldn't study philosophy or any other scholastic endeavor either, at least not very deeply. We must get beyond that mindset. We need excellent education to raise up the Daniels in our midst to take dominion for Christ's kingdom. The education of our children must also be excellent so that the knowledge can be preserved. I'm reminded about how the Irish saved Western civilization after the fall of Rome. They did so by sequestering writings and knowledge away from destruction by the barbarians. A few centuries later, they were in position to single-handedly refound European civilization, as it says in the book by that title. How do we educate our children? The answer is in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
teaching God's words to our children diligently, talking about them in your houses, when walking by the way, when lying down, and when rising up, constantly. This includes talking about God's world in homeschool or day school. That's the question. Should we be educating our children in homeschool or day school? And the answer is yes. There are advantages and disadvantages disadvantages to each. Homeschool is less expensive, but it is a huge time commitment. And I can talk from this because I had, I had a child that was educated in public schools, homeschool, private school, went to a Catholic high school. So I basically, one of our, child, one of our children ran the gamut in, in her education. And she still likes me. Where was I? There are advantages and disadvantages to each, obviously. Homeschool is less expensive, but it's a huge time commitment. Christian day schools are much more expensive and still require a great deal of parental oversight. In the long run, I personally think day schools are better, but I have to admit that's probably my own bias. For one reason, there can be an economy of scale in a day school. Many children can have access to a great teacher. In the higher grades, there can be experts in subjects like history, science, literature, and writing. I know calling someone an expert raises hackles among our group because of all the expert advice that was doled out during the COVID pandemic. But getting teaching from someone who loves their subject, has spent a great deal of time studying it, learning it, and is good at transmitting that love and that knowledge to students, that is a blessing beyond words. This means that sooner or later, there will need to be specialization. Only in a school setting, only in a day school can that occur. There is just no way a parent who wants to teach their children at home can become expert in all subjects. There are not enough hours in the day. Should this education be classical? That's certainly popular at the moment. And I've been on the board of two classical Christian schools. It does make sense from the aspect of teaching children to learn in the best way accommodated to their age. Young children are to memorize things, so let them. That's the pole parrot or grammar stage, pole parrot as uh, Dorothy Sayers said. When they get to be older and like to argue, teach them logic so that they can argue effectively. That's the logic stage. As they get older yet, and read and study more, they can use the facts they memorized as youngsters and the logic they learned as young teens and apply that in an effective means of communication, both spoken and written. That's the rhetoric stage. This makes sense to me, but I don't think it has to be done that way. The point is to teach children all subjects to the glory of God. How the subject relates to God must be taught. Remember, there is no neutrality. What about public schools? There have been people, <laughs> I'm sure to offend somebody here, so. Somebody, I read somewhere this week that the problem with pastors today is that there are not enough of them being killed. So, I trust that I won't get killed over those. There have been people saying for years that public schools were a problem, especially for Christian kids. And there have been many pastors that I know of and have heard that still refuse to tell their parishioners to take their kids out of public schools. When I was on the board of the Classical Christian School in Spokane, there were 45 different churches represented in our school by the kids in our school. One pastor would ever tell parents to send their kids to a Christian school. One. One out of 45. I, and it was our pastor, obviously. Um, the last three years have revealed that the first group were right. Public schools are the problem. And now we're seeing the fruit of it. We now have a generation coming up that has been taught all of the Marx, Marxist doctrines as if they had grown up sitting at the feet of Lenin or Mao. These people will be our leaders someday, all because we let the progressives take over the public schools. 
So if it is at all possible, we should get our kids out of public schools. Having said that, there are instances where that is not possible. There are people who cannot, who do not have the option to use use other than the public schools. There are other extenuating circumstances. These should be the exception, not the rule. I've known of mothers that that were working, they were single mothers, they had to send their children to public schools because they had to work to support their family and they certainly did not have time to stay home and educate their children. Now, you could argue that our church should have been paying for those mothers as if they were widows, and we probably should have, but be, be that as it may, that was an extenuating circumstances, circumstance. And there are other extenuating circumstances, but these should be the exception and not the rule. And it is not the same as Christian parents who send their kids to public schools because it was good enough for me or because I pay for the public schools, I'm sure going to get my money's worth. Those are no longer acceptable arguments. So how do we get out of this predicament? Educate our kids in a Christian fashion is the answer. But if you read, if you read books and, and newsletters about how to get out of the predicament, most of the answers seem to come down to classical Christian schools. There are about 300 classical Christian schools in this country with roughly 60,000 students. And that number has grown a great deal in the past few years, thank God. We can also thank God that there are 3.1 million homeschoolers, and I assume that most of those are Christian. And there are also many thousands of students in other Christian day schools. I don't know that number. But there are something like 50 million public school students. Given the numbers, we have a long way to go to have the infrastructure and teacher manpower to make a dent in those public school numbers. And also, classical Christian schools are no longer flying under the radar like we have for the past 20 years. I'm sure some of you read about a a couple weeks ago about a Pepperdine professor who's part of the classical Christian school movement. And she wrote that white supremacy is an inherent feature of classical Christian education. The basic idea is that the reading lists of who they read should have equal numbers of women and people of color as of white males. This is one area that homeschoolers do have it over day schoolers. It's easier for the bureaucrats in the Department of Education or public school officials to go after schools with concentrated number of students than it is to go after each individual family. Ultimately, the battle over education will be for the children. To whom do the children belong? We all know that our kids belong to God, and we are stewards in raising them. But the state thinks that children belong to it. A progressive minister in the early 1900s even said so, quote, my child is first a national child. He belongs to the nation even before he belongs to himself, unquote. And the overreaching state has a vested interest in our children because they are having less and less of their own. Some estimates are that one third of the children in the past 50 years have been aborted. Birth rates in this country, like the rest of the developed world, are plummeting. And now there's the permanent maiming of children in the trans movement. The powers that be are going to need our kids. Otherwise, they can't replace themselves, at least not until they can manufacture them like Brave New World. So what do we do? We teach our children the basic tenets of the Christian faith at home. I think we're all far enough along to know that. When it comes to education, we have choices, whether homeschooling or schools like St. Giles or Blue Springs. As parents, especially fathers, we still have to oversee the the education of our children. Except in rare circumstances, I don't think public schools should be an option for our Christian children. This means we need to make sacrifices. We need to give extra time, and we need to give extra money. We need to do this in order to educate our children in conformity to the Lord. We have to make sacrifices. But following our Lord Jesus Christ, Christians have been making sacrifices for centuries. 
this is ours. This is our time. This is our sacrifice. We may wish we lived in different times, but we must remember God raised each of us just for this point in history. It's like Mordecai and Esther. At that point, things looked pretty good for God's people. The king had given orders to kill them all. Yet Esther was able to persuade persuade the king otherwise. As Mordecai said to her, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for just such a time as this. Do we despair? Of course not. We believe God is supernaturally in charge of this education situation, just as he is in charge of the entire cultural situation we find ourselves in. Our job is to be obedient to him. He will work this out, the education of our children and the reformation of the entire culture in his time. He will work it out for his glory. And just as he promised the Israelites in Deuteronomy 6, it will be for our good, for the good of our children and grandchildren. It will be that our days may be prolonged, that we may have full houses and full barns, in a land flowing with milk and honey, in a land where every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is why we need a Christian education for our children. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Please bless us with your spirit. Please bless us with your spirit that your word might be written on our hearts. Grant to us the stamina to do your work for our children and our culture and our church. Grant us the courage to teach our children according to your word and to stand up to the culture. Put your spirit in our hearts that we might be more like Christ. And together we pray that prayer he taught his disciples singing.